Today on Behind the Space Bar, I'm sharing some of my biggest onstage failures and flops, plus I'm sharing a few that you all submitted on Instagram. So let's all join in the misery together and celebrate our failures. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to Behind the Space Bar. This is gonna be a super fun episode. First off, I've, I've taken a couple weeks off of recording uh, new content, been working on some things, and been trying to get done. Um, and I'm super excited because I'm sitting down today. Uh, I've got a stack full of, uh, of notes here, uh, content to record. And this is at the top of the list because this is a episode, this is content I've really, really been looking forward to getting out. So I reached out about a month or so ago on Instagram and I said, hey, I wanna talk about some of our biggest onstage failures, biggest onstage mistakes. Um, uh, if you're willing, share those. And I had a few of you reach out, some you know, DM'd me the story so it's not public, um, but some of you shared some really, really fantastic stuff. And I've got a couple stories I wanna share personally um, uh, about my own kind of failures and mistakes I've made on stage. But I think it's important before we dive into today's uh, uh, kind of misery and we all wallow in our own misery, uh, I think it's important to uh, just talk about why failures are, are super important. Uh, there's a really great show, uh, and I've talked about this years and years ago, uh, called Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It's in its final season now, and it's a show my wife and I love, uh, and it's about this, this uh, lady, Mrs. Maisel, who becomes a comic, and it's kind of her story through failure, through learning how to be a comic, how to develop a, a, a good show, uh, put on a good show, and um, eventually, hopefully, lead to success. Uh, and one of the, I believe it's in season two, one of the best bits I heard is um, uh, uh, Mrs. Maisel's manager, Susie, talking about the, the, the value of bombing. And Mrs. Maisel had a particularly bad show where things went bad, and she talked about how you've got to bomb to get to the good. You've got to do a lot of bad to get to the good. And it's just that idea of, um, you know, I, I often talk about, I'm not sure what's more important, quantity or quality, but I can guarantee you that the only path to quality is through quantity. So that's why last year, for instance, I did a video every single day. Um, some of them, the audio was messed up and some of you have let me know multiple, multiple times. Thank you, I, I get the point. Uh, some of them, the camera shots were a little odd as I got into the new space and some of you have let me know multiple, multiple times. Thank you, I get it. Um, but through that process, through cr continually creating, through continually producing quantity, it's slowly but surely leading me to quality. And there's still always room to improve. Kaizen, continuous improvement, that constant process of getting 1% better every single time. But if our goal in stepping on stage is simply to avoid, avoid failure, then we'll never step on stage in the first place. And I was really reminded of this um, uh, about a week ago, I went to my daughter's ballet performance and um, she's four years old at the time of recording this, first time ever in ballet, um, maybe first or second time on stage. But it was fascinating watching uh, everyone as they got on stage and you would see the kids that would just stare at the other kid, kind of watching them to, to, uh, for signs and signals and for the younger kids, the teacher was out front kind of giving directions and leading them. But I thought it's really easy to look on and say like, oh man, these kids just, they're not getting it. What a waste of money because the parents paid all this money for their kids to be in ballet, to just get on stage and flop. But I thought, man, that's building the reps. That's building the muscle for these kids soon, you know, in the future to stand on stage, to sing in front of people, to speak in front of people, whether they're future CEOs, their future creatives, their future musicians, um, whether they're recording podcasts, YouTube tutorials, whatever it is, that process of standing on stage, exposing themselves uh, to, to potential failure uh, and becoming okay with mistakes is what's gonna eventually lead them to success. So, okay, soapbox over, um, uh, no more preaching this episode. I wanna get into some of our failures and mistakes. Um, I'll start with one of mine and I'll, I'll maybe sprinkle a few of mine in there. Uh, before I do that though, I wanna let you know, if uh, you're wanting to get into using Ableton Live on stage for tracks, or maybe you've been using Ableton Live on stage for tracks and it's just not the most flexible way, you're, you're kind of stuck, it's taking forever to build a set. You, you can't edit your songs easily, you can't jump around easily, you can't customize them easily then um, you need to move from the way you're doing it to a proven process. And I wanna share my exact proven process, something I call the three-part framework for using tracks. 
I'll teach you exactly how to do that, plus give you a free template. Uh, all you have to do is head to from studio to stage.com slash template. You can download that free template, which is available um, uh, for every version of Ableton Live, intro, light, standard, and suite. Um, you can head there to learn more information. Plus, when you download that free template, you can enroll in my free six day email course where uh, I'll show you exactly how to set up that template and exactly how to use it. So again, if you're looking for a better way to use tracks or um, learning for the first time how to use tracks from studio to stage.com slash template is the best place to go. So first I wanna share a, a bit of a story uh, and I believe I've shared this before on the podcast here, but um, this is a, a musical, not Ableton related, not tracks related uh, thing. Um, so no real context there, but this was uh, back when I was in college and um, one of the bands I played in, um, uh, for college was a band where we do a lot of um, not orchestral what's the word i'm looking for choir right we'd have a lot of big choir arrangements um and so uh with choir tunes often comes a lot of key changes right and this was a kind of southern gospel-y type context and so lots of thematic theme changes uh, key changes and if you've ever heard us one of those songs performed or been in particularly a church where they're performed, you know, it kind of starts low and then we have a bunch of key changes and eventually everyone has to stand up at like the third verse, right? Or going from the second verse into the second chorus. And so we're at one of those moments, I'm playing electric guitar. We're in a, um, an auditorium uh, at the school I went to of, of, of probably 10 to 15,000 people. So it's, it's packed. I believe this was even for a conference potentially. So a lot of, a lot of eyes on and ears listening, a lot of eyes watching. And so um, I think we're in the key of G, if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, typically key changes I was used to are like a whole step key change. So we'd go from G to A, but you you get into that context of music and sometimes there was like the, the rare awkward key change that would be a hole and a half, right? So instead of a whole step, hole and a half. So in this case, uh, I was I was pretty pretty confident this was a whole step key change and we get to go to that transition so uh, you know we're on a D chord building three and four and and then I go and just hit the loudest A chord you've ever heard in your entire life not realizing that in fact this was a whole and a half step key change and I should be on B flat instead of A um, and so that was a, a really fun moment of just blaring the the most massive half step down wrong incorrect chord that you could potentially play uh, but in that moment i was reminded of something my guitar teacher told me a long time ago when i first started playing guitar which is you're only a half step away from the right note so i just whoop popped up there and we were good uh but a, a guy that uh, was a he wasn't a teacher but he was kind of in charge of the bands at the school i went to uh loves to remind me of that story he says it's one of his favorite stories so scott that one is for you. Okay, so I wanna to get to, um, we'll, we'll run through a couple of these, some really good ones you guys submitted to celebrate. Uh, let me know in the comments uh, as you hear these if this has happened to you or uh, if um, you have a great story you wanna share in the comments. So first, let's start with my buddy Chris. Chris Yim submitted this one. Uh, he first reached out and asked for some clarification, but he first said, I, I was performing a, a pop song with my wife only to realize there was only sound in the in-ears, no sound in front of house. So imagine stepping on stage, pressing play on Ableton, you start performing this song and he's like rocking out, it's him and his wife and tracks and everything's going great and it sounds fantastic. Uh, and I reached out and I said, well, Chris, kind of what happened? And he said, well, we finished verse one and we realized the audience had no response whatever, whatsoever. They're just completely deadpan. So he took his ears out and he realized with horror that there was no audio coming from Ableton, coming from their setup whatsoever to the audience. So he very, very quickly uh, did some rerouting and um, in Ableton and on his soundboard and was able to get audio uh, going before the course. So just imagine sitting there performing in front of a group of people, feeling like, man, this is the best we've ever sounded. You're rocking out, got good stage presence. And then suddenly you look and go, why is no one responding? That's because no one could hear a single thing. Okay, uh, this is a good one. Uh, Led Rebels or LED Rebels on Instagram reached out and said, um, and this has happened to me as well too, said that um, someone, I won't name names, forgot to plug in the laptop's power supply. So this is really, really easy to do, particularly on laptops. You know, you've got redundant laptops or um, and, and uh, LED Rebels or Led Rebels uh, uh, instant. Um, they had an audio laptop and a Resolume laptop. And so it's you know easy to maybe do one and not the other. In this case, they forgot to plug in both laptops, which is very fun. Um, it's easy to miss, right? You got a lot of cables on stage, but 
uh, LED Rebels said that both the audio laptop and the Resolume laptop went down mid-show. So um, that's always a fun experience because you're suddenly playing, music is super loud, you've got visuals synced up, and then just black, right? My buddy uh, Jeremy used to say, uh, when it works, it's fantastic, and when it doesn't work, it's just black, right? Um, this has happened to me, so thanks, LED, uh, or Lead Rebels for sharing that one. That's also happened to me, not because of uh, power supply, this is another story I wanna share, uh, but because my computer was not powerful enough, and so this was, um, uh, I was working in Florida at the time on staff at a church there, and uh, we wanted to do something different for the college ministry. And uh, so what we did is we kind of arranged like a, a set, probably five songs, uh, piano, we had um, acoustic piano. Uh, I think the worship leader is on acoustic guitar, if I remember correctly. Um, I was playing like keys and then tracks. And so it was, you know, no drums, it was all loop bass, that sort of thing. Um, and spent a lot of time on arrangements. I think I came up with some actual pretty cool arrangements of some songs we were doing. Had those loaded into Ableton. The problem was is I was using a laptop at that point that I had gotten in college that was probably six years old, and it was probably four years too old to be using on stage, right? So about four years before this, I should have replaced it to get a laptop. Uh, it was too slow four years ago, and I kept holding on to it four years longer. So anyway, the laptop was just super, super not powerful enough. Um, and uh, had an interface that was not, uh, it was FireWire, can't remember which one. It was the kind of square with a circular thing. I can't remember which FireWire that was, but that tells you how long ago it was. So FireWire connection. Uh, I believe I even had a like FireWire card for my computer. That's how old this was. I had to put a card in, which then allowed FireWire. You know, long story longer. Um, we start the first song. Everything sounded great. It's a really cool vibe. Running in stereo, so we're getting some cool painting and movement happening with tracks. Um, everything's just great, and then. Zhoo, Computer just completely dies. Interface won't connect. Um, it's not power. My, my uh, power supply was plugged in in that case. Uh, and it was just that the computer was not powerful enough to run tracks. That interface did not work well with that computer. So we ended up doing the rest of the set, just acoustic and uh, just complete utter disappointment, both on behalf of me, the worship leader, who's kind of the, the guy in charge and was leading that particular time. And uh, I think everyone kind of went, oh, well, that was kind of a massive disappointment. So that was a phone for me. Here's, a, here's another good one that has happened in a church scenario. Chris, um, Chris went through, uh, uh, Chris, which cohort did Chris? Uh, Chris went through our connected stage cohort a couple years ago, uh, worship leader in North Carolina, and he reached out and shared this, which I thought was just a really, really great experience. So he said, um, instead of starting tracks at the beginning of church service, the drummer fired a dead mouse song uh, in iTunes. So just imagine um, uh, going to start a church service. Everyone's kind of anxiously waiting. They're anticipating the start and suddenly they hear a dead mouse song uh, play through front of house, probably cranked pretty, pretty loud because it was the first song. So similar experiences happened to me. I was the one who did it. I'm not going to name the person's name because I didn't ask their permission for this, but uh, a band I was in college, our drummer went to start uh, a song and this was like post the, uh, the sermon, post the message it was a church scenario in context. And uh, so it's a very small, uh, low, somber, introspective moment. And suddenly he, he triggered a song that starts four on the floor, kick drum, super, super loud. So super fun moment with that. Okay. Um, Cody reached out. Cody said he had a situation where uh, he had set up uh, some routing in Ableton with MIDI and that did not work properly. And so they ended up going into a whole completely different song with different key and very, very heavy tracks when they were supposed to re repeat a section. So imagine just uh, pretending you're in the moment repeating a section of a song. Uh, and instead of, uh, of repeating that, uh, suddenly it goes into a completely different song with uh, a different key change. And not only that, but lots and lots of tracks. So Cody, thanks for sharing that one. That was a really good one. Uh, Florian, this one's, a, this one's kind of a, a deep cut. Um, uh, if you know, and I think I have it back here somewhere, uh, yeah, it's back, back there on my desk there. Uh, but Florian said someone changed their Dante patch for their direct out xbox.md, which is a great box that I said I had sitting there, uh, which Florian then had to fix during the intro of the song. So, um, fun moment for Florian, which, uh, which I'm sure, uh, was very, very enjoyable for, uh, Florian as well as everyone else involved. Uh, another one from Florian. And said that Ableton shut down on both computers 
at the same exact time. So that's definitely a fun bug. Uh, I've, uh, I've never had that happen where you've had a redundant system and both computers failed at the same time. Uh, I hope it was at a point where you could, you know, reboot the computers or reboot Ableton and recover. But um, yeah, so that's, I guess that's the situation. I, I always think of that meme with, it's like two toilet paper holders and it says even redundant systems fail sometimes. So uh, that was really good. So Florian, thanks for sharing. Okay, I've got two more I want to share. Uh, one from my good buddy David and one from Kay, who is a lifetime subscriber on the site. Uh, before I do that though, I again want to remind you, if you're wanting to get started with using tracks on stage, and you want to hopefully avoid some of these mistakes that we've shared here uh, today, um, then head to from studio to stages.com slash template. You can download my free track symbol, which is available for every version of Ableton Live, light, intro, standard, suite. Uh, and when you download the template, not only do you get the template, you're not left to try to figure it out on your own. Uh, I'm gonna take you through a six day email course. So I'm gonna show you exactly how to set up that template and use that template with your content. So again, if you wanna get access to that, head to from studio to stage.com slash template. Okay, um, final two here, uh, my buddy David. Um, David and I worked together for a, a bit in Florida. Uh, David said he forgot the entire verse one of a song and he had no confidence monitor with lyrics. Uh, lyric sheets and charts weren't allowed on stage. And so he's up on stage uh, singing, leading worship in this context, and completely forgot a entire verse of a song. So I often joke with my friends that are worship leaders, you'll hear this in church sometimes. I mean, you'll hear there's some other artists as well too, but you'll hear people say, you guys sing it out. Um, but I joke that that's like the go-to that worship leaders in particular use when they forget the lyrics. You guys sing it. And then they step away from the mic and, you know, regain their thoughts, regain their composure um, because um, they forgot everything. So that was really, really fun. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's wrap up with Kay's um, onstage failure, which this is a pretty good one, Kay. Um, and Kay shared this one and um, uh, Kay works with a lot of large artists, I believe in Germany. I, I hope I'm getting that right, Kay. But um, I know uh, across the pond a bit uh, uh, from here in South Carolina. And uh, Kay's done some very large like arena tours, lots of pyro, lots of time code, that sort of stuff. So, uh, but Kay shared this one, which I thought was really, really great. So Kay said, my biggest onstage fail. It was my first show as a playback engineer operator for a huge act. So again, imagine you've done playback before, but it's your very first show for a massive arena act. Um, this, is, this is always not a good sign, a good start to a story. The MD, the music director, handed me the session four minutes before showtime to put it on my machine. So um, I, I'm not gonna try to preach in the middle of this, but I tell people all the time, like if you wait to four minutes before a show and something goes wrong, you can't be mad at the person or the gear that, that you know, something went wrong. It's like, you're changing things four minutes before, you're just inviting mistakes in, right? So poor Case, he's stuck there, he gets the set. Um, uh, four minutes before, he says there's a 15,000 person audience plus radio live stream. He said he started the intro and all the sound effects in the intro sounded completely, completely wrong. Uh, when the click started, he needed to stop the session immediately. Um, everything was just completely, completely off. He said as he dug in instantly in that moment, he realized that the tempo track was set to 102, but the session played everything at 128 BPM. So he had to very quickly go in, reset the tempo track, and say, no, 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 I don't need you to be 128, I need you to be 102, set that from follower to leader, and he fixed it. And he said it was the worst seconds in his entire life. So, Kay, I uh, apologize, you had to go through it, uh, through that, uh, but hopefully the gig worked out. I mean, obviously I know you're still out there doing playback and working with a lot of large artists, so. Uh, clearly the MD realized it was their issue and not your issue. Uh, but I'm glad that didn't stop Kay. I'm glad that didn't stop David, Florian, Chris, uh, Led Rebels, myself, or my buddy Chris Yim from continuing to step on stage and continuing to perform. So don't let your failures be the thing that stops you from stepping on stage. Don't let the, the, the possibility of failure be the thing that keeps you off stage. Failures are a part of the journey and walking that journey and continually doing our craft and getting our reps in is what's gonna lead us to doing something really, really well. Remember, quantity leads to quality. So I hope that's an encouragement for you today. This was a fun episode for me. Again, just to um, to have a moment sharing some stories, both from my own life, where things went miserably, horribly wrong on stage, as well as sharing some of you guys' stories. So 
Um, if you enjoyed this episode, the best thing you can do is give me a like, uh, give me a comment if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on um, Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, then go ahead and follow the show. Again, you can leave a rating and review there. If you're listening on YouTube, then hit subscribe, enable the bell icon. Again, leave a comment. I wanna hear from you guys. What's the biggest onstage failure mistake that you've ever had? Um, and let's own, an, own our mistakes, let's own up to it so we can get better and so that we realize the path to success is paved with failures and mistakes. Thanks so much for watching, thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Take care, everybody, bye.